I am really excited to start teaching this section of the course, and I hope that you are also excited to learn in this section of the course. This is all about the frequency domain and using the Fourier transform to get into the frequency domain and then doing spectral analyses of time series data. In this video, I'm going to give a kind of big picture introduction to set you up for the rest of this section. So I'll talk about the time domain and the frequency domain and how to kind of see a signal in both the time and the frequency domains. And that will allow me to highlight for you two advantages of looking at a signal in the frequency domain instead of in the time domain. And then I'll close the video by talking about the kind of building blocks or the, the tree of knowledge that you need to understand the Fourier transform. So let's get started. Here we have two signals. This is in the time domain. And this is the representation of those signals in the frequency domain. So this is the amplitude spectrum of these two signals. So how do we interpret these bars here? And how do we relate these bars to these time varying fluctuations? So the way to do that is to consider that this is a pure sine wave. So that makes going into the frequency domain really easy. And let's just count the number of rhythms, the number of pulses or repetitions, cycles that we see in the period of one second. So it's one, two, three. And then we almost get here, but actually this is going to end up being over one second. So we have three cycles appearing in the time span of one second. So that corresponds to three hertz. Then we get a bar here at three hertz. And then the height of this bar is one here on this plot. And that corresponds to one half of the distance between the troughs and the peaks. So you can see, well, I guess you can't really see, but there's no tick here. But you can imagine that this is minus one and this is plus one. So the distance from the trough to the peak is actually two because we go from minus one to plus one. And so one half of that distance is the height that gets plotted here. Now why that is one half of the distance and not the full distance is somewhat of a mystery now, but it will make sense in a few videos from now when we start talking about complex sine waves and complex dot products. So for now, suffice it to say that the amplitude value here corresponds to half of this distance. All right, so let's do the same procedure for this signal here. So we have one, two, three, four, five cycles within a period of one second. And then here we see a bar at five hertz. And then this goes up to two, and here we have this the troughs at minus two and the peaks at plus two. That's a total distance of four, and then half of that is two, of course. So these are two pretty simple signals. There's really just one component in each of these signals. Here we have another signal, which is still pretty simple, but it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more involved. You can probably guess that the way that I created this signal was by combining these two. So literally this thing plus this thing gives us this thing. Okay, now, you know, when you look at this in context, it's pretty easy to tell what's going on. But if I just showed you this signal and asked you, what are the components? How many individual components are there in this signal and what are those components you could probably figure it out that it was this plus this but it would take you a little while uh, to figure it out it would take you at least several seconds and that's in the time domain but now when we go to the frequency domain it's a totally different story you look at this signal in the time domain uh, or sorry in the frequency domain and it takes like 50 milliseconds to figure out that this signal has two components one at three hertz with an amplitude of one and one at five hertz with an amplitude of two. So this right here highlights one of the main advantages of looking at a signal, inspecting a signal in the frequency domain compared to the time domain. And that is that if the signal contains rhythmic narrow, comp narrow band components, which is the case here, it's not the case for all signals, but if the signal is made up of narrowband spectral features, then you can understand the signal much better and much faster when looking at the signal in the frequency domain compared to the time domain. Again, that is not 
trivially true for all signals regardless of how they're made up. But under some conditions, signals are much easier to understand when looking at them in the frequency domain. Okay, so that is one advantage of the frequency domain. Now I'm going to show you another advantage, and that is having to do with noise. So here I have exactly the same underlying signals that I showed in the previous slide. The only difference is that I've added random noise to all three of these signals. So now if I would ask you to tell me, you know, what is the dominant sinusoidal components of these uh, three signals, then, you know, you could figure it out. If you looked at this for a, a few moments, you would say, well, there's one, two, three in one second, and then here it repeats one, two, three. And here you can count five. This is going to be much harder. You're not really going to be able to guess that this is a three hertz sine wave plus a five hertz sine wave from looking at this panel. But watch what happens when we go into the frequency domain. These exact same signals, again, with this amount of noise, it's kind of difficult, not impossible, but it's difficult to look at this signal and understand that it's a three hertz signal plus noise. But when you look at it in the frequency domain, it is totally trivial. You see immediately that we have a three hertz sine wave component with an amplitude of one plus broadband noise with low amplitude. And same story here and same story here. So the noise is much more a deleterious in the time domain and it's much tinier in the frequency domain. Now why is that the case? That is happening because this is white noise that I've added so it it has a flat power spectrum in the frequency domain but it, the time domain is actually all of these frequencies added up. So when you add up all of these little uh, contributions of small power for lots and lots of frequencies in the time domain that ends up being a large amount of noise even though for any individual frequency it's quite small. So therefore looking at a signal in the frequency domain can also improve the signal to noise characteristics of interpreting the signal. And that is the second advantage of the frequency domain or looking at a signal in the frequency domain that I would like to highlight in this video. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about time and frequency domains for now. And then I want to mention briefly the computational foundations of the Fourier transform. So what I'm going to show you in this slide is a diagram of all the individual things, the pieces of knowledge that you need to acquire in order to completely understand the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform. So we start with the most important foundational parts, and that's these three things here. So you need to know about sine waves, you need to know about complex numbers, and you need to know about the dot product. Now I'm sure you've heard about sine waves, you've probably heard about complex numbers, but maybe you haven't, and maybe some of you have heard of the dot product, or maybe you haven't really heard of the dot product. So regardless of how familiar you are with these three concepts, I'm going to explain basically everything that you need to know about these three mathematical concepts, sine waves, complex numbers, and the dot product. And then the next layer of understanding the Fourier transform is basically just to combine these things. So we are going to combine the sine waves and complex numbers, and there, uh, that will allow us to create something called complex sine waves. And then we're going to combine complex numbers and the dot product to create a complex dot product. And then what do we do here? You guessed it. We combine these two things, complex sine waves and a complex dot product. And that actually leads to a Fourier coefficient. And that is the entire goal of the Fourier transform. The purpose of the Fourier transform is to obtain the Fourier coefficient. So you can see it's actually not that much knowledge that we need to build up. We're going to start right from the ground up, from the very bottom, learning about sine waves, complex numbers, and dot products, putting them together, and getting fairly quickly into the Fourier coefficients. And so we will begin our journey in the next video with sine waves. I look forward to seeing you soon.